You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Founded in 1881, the Sons of Union Veterans of the Civil War is a congressionally chartered, charitable, fraternal organization that preserves the history and legacy of the Union veterans who fought during the Civil War to save the Union and end slavery. When you join, you enter a national network of men who form lifelong bonds, honor their heroic ancestors, and promote historic preservation, education, and patriotism in their communities. The Sons of Union Veterans of the Civil War accepts both descendants of Civil War veterans and non-descendants. Visit them today at www.suvcw.org or email them at join at suvcw.org. The views, information, or opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of the SUVCW. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to episode 455 of our Civil War podcast. My name is Rich. And I'm Tracy. Hello y'all. Welcome to the show. As you guys will recall, with the last episode, we talked about the experiences of POWs during the Civil War. And we mentioned that with this show, we'd be looking at the mass escape from Libby Prison in Richmond that took place in February 1864. So... Here we go. Our story begins on the last day of September 1863, when about 100 federal officers, who two weeks before had been captured at the Battle of Chickamauga, were now arriving in Richmond. Colonel Thomas Rose entered Libby the day after the other Chickamauga prisoners. Like them, he arrived in Richmond by train, but in a passenger car rather than crammed into a filthy box car. The delay occurred because he had managed to escape the POW train when it halted in Weldon, North Carolina, and he spent a day wandering in the woods before being recaptured. He blamed his inability to evade the rebels on an injury he'd suffered the previous winter, saying, quote, I was still very lame from the effects of a broken foot from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Now, as the 33-year-old commander of the 77th Pennsylvania entered Libby, his senses were assaulted by the sight and smell of the haggard men already imprisoned there. By this time in the war, the fall of 1863, around 1,000 federal officers were already packed into Libby. There was little hope of freedom in the foreseeable future since prisoner exchanges between the Union and Confederacy had ended the previous spring, so the men locked up inside Libby could expect to remain there for months, perhaps even years. However, Thomas Rose was unwilling to accept that fate. He had heard bad things about Libby, and now his first impressions were even worse. And so, on the very day of his arrival, he determined to find a way out of the horrid place, no matter what it took. Escape, though, would not be easy. By the fall of 1863, Libby Prison was a household name in the North. Everyone had read or heard accounts of the brutality, starvation, and deprivation that were commonplace at the warehouse-turned-prison in the Confederate capital. A man named Luther Libby unwittingly lent his name to the notorious military prison since it was his warehouse the Confederate authorities confiscated for official use. He had run a ship chandling business out of the building, and Libby had so little time to vacate the place that he left up the Libby and Son sign, hence the name of the prison. And FYI, a ship chandler, dealt in supplies and equipment for ships and boats. 
In any case, taking up a whole city block, the building stood along Cary Street toward the bottom of a south-facing hill that sloped toward the James River. Between the prison's rear wall and the river lay a narrow road and a canal. Three lots abutted the prison property, two of them empty. There wasn't much else close to the building, so escapees would have precious few places to hide while trying to flee. To make escape more difficult, the Confederates had whitewashed the lower portion of Libby's walls, so a prisoner standing against such a high-contrast background would stick out like a sore thumb. When Rose was brought to Libby Prison, he would have approached it from the Cary Street side. From that vantage point, the building appeared to have three floors. The first held an office and sleeping quarters for prison staff, a hospital, and a kitchen. As Rose entered the building near the west end, he would have been hustled up a stairway to the prisoners' quarters on the top two levels. Each of those floors was divided into three large rooms, each just over 100 feet long and 45 feet wide. The new arrivals from Chickamauga were housed in the middle rooms on both floors, and those compartments became known as the Chickamauga Rooms. Only three floors were visible from Cary Street because the slope of the hill concealed the fact a basement ran the length of the building. There were ground-level doors into the basement on the riverside. Like the upper floors, the basement was divided into three large rooms. The west end was a storage cellar, the middle contained a carpenter shop, and several cells to confine special prisoners, and the east end was another storage area. The East End also had a small kitchen for the prisoners to use. About two feet of straw covered most of the floor in the cellar's East End storage room, and this provided enough nesting material for a thriving population of rats, and the room had been dubbed Rat Hell. Prisoners were allowed into Rat Hell to use the cooking facilities. One afternoon, Rose was exploring the dark end of the cellar, the part nearest Cary Street, when he ran into Major Andrew Hamilton of the 12th Kentucky Cavalry, U.S. Like Rose, Hamilton was snooping around the secluded end of Rat Hell with the hope of finding a way to escape. The two men agreed to join forces. Shortly after Rose and Hamilton met, the Confederates decided to shut down the cellar kitchen. The prisoners were now to do all their cooking in the kitchen in the middle room of the first floor, that is, the Cary Street level. With the closing of the basement kitchen, prisoners were no longer allowed in the cellar. Rose spent hours scrutinizing the guards inside and outside the prison to learn their routines. All the while, he gathered tools to use in making an escape. One night, he was able to lift some floorboards in the kitchen on the first floor and crawl down into the carpenter shop, where he collected a few chisels and other tools. When several bales of blankets and clothing were donated to the prisoners, the rebels selected several prisoners to oversee the distribution of the items. One of them was able to take a length of rope from the bales and pass it on to Rose. After examining several options, Rose finally decided the only practical way to escape was to tunnel out of Rat Hell. But first he had to find a way to get into the closed-off basement. He noticed that the fireplace behind the cook stoves in the first-floor kitchen shared a chimney with an unused fireplace below in Rat Hell. Rose thought he could dig a narrow passageway through the masonry between the two fireplaces without disturbing the stonework in the carpenter shop or hospital room, where the Confederates might notice something was amiss. Rose told Hamilton about his plan, and the two men went to work. Rose and Hamilton were able to slip into the kitchen during the night without much difficulty, but once there, Rose recalled, quote, We were obliged to make no noise, for one of the sentinels was just outside within ten feet of where we were. Over the course of several nights, the two successfully chiseled an S-shaped tunnel from the back of the kitchen fireplace 
to the fireplace below in Rat Hell. However, when Rose tried to lower himself down, he got stuck. He recalled, quote, As soon as my feet and legs were dangling below, the inevitable law of gravitation forced my body into the hole as tight as a wedge. I was perfectly helpless. Hamilton, try as he might, couldn't budge Rose, so he made his way upstairs to awaken a friend, Lieutenant F.F. F. Bennett of the 18th U.S. Infantry. Together, Hamilton and Bennett were able to free Rose with one massive tug. Rose wrote, quote, We all three fell upon the floor with a prodigious noise. The sentinel seemed startled and confused. The noisemakers held their breath for what seemed like an eternity, expecting the alarm to be raised and the rebels to burst through the door any second, bayonets at the ready. To their great relief, though, no one came. After enlarging the hole to prevent a repeat, Rose and Hamilton facilitated movement through the S-curve by fashioning the rope into a ladder by adding convenient wooden rungs. Meanwhile, Rose dedicated daytime hours to determining the best location for the tunnel. From the prison's upper floor windows, he maintained a surveillance of the surrounding area. One day he noticed workmen entering a sewer in the canal side street. Rose reasoned that the sewer would be a virtual highway to freedom and estimated that it would take a tunnel perhaps as short as 15 feet to reach it. With the decision made to connect with the sewer pipe, Hamilton and Rose began tunneling out the canal side of Rat Hell. The digging went smoothly at first, until less than five feet in, the candles went out. From then on, it was necessary for one man to station himself at the tunnel's entrance and fan fresh air into the opening to supply the candles and the tunneler with oxygen. Rose also realized they would need more manpower, so he and Hamilton recruited 13 other prisoners and divided them into three squads of five men each. Each squad worked one night and then had two nights off. Each member of a squad had specific duties. The best digger would crawl into the tunnel, which was barely wide and tall enough for one man to squeeze through. Armed with a candle and a tool, the digger loosened the earth at his head and put it into a spittoon. Some stolen clothesline had been tied to the spittoon, and the digger gave the line a tug when it was full. Another man in the squad pulled out the dirt, which was then spread about the floor of Rat Hell. A third squad member fanned fresh air into the tunnel. When it was just Rose and Hamilton, they'd used a hat as a fan. But as the tunnel lengthened, the hat didn't move enough air into it, so Hamilton fashioned a larger, more effective fan by stretching a rubber blanket over a light frame. A fourth man served as a relief for the others while the final member of the five-man squad served as a lookout. At the close of each shift, the squad hid the tunneling tools in the dark recesses of Rat Hell, and then climbed back through the S-shaped tunnel to the kitchen above. There, the men carefully replaced the bricks in the opening and smeared soot over the fireplace wall, so that it was nearly impossible to detect the entrance to the S-shaped tunnel. The digging was hard work, but by rotating the three squads, the tunneling could continue every night. Difficulties and obstacles cropped up along the way, most of which the prisoners tackled with some ingenuity and hard work, but one problem proved insurmountable. When water began trickling into the tunnel in ever-increasing amounts, it appeared the entire excavation would flood. As the danger increased, Rose and Hamilton decided to abandon the tunnel and refill it with dirt. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by the Sons of Union Veterans of the Civil War. Do you have an interest in the Civil War? Founded in 1881, the SUVCW is a congressionally chartered, charitable, fraternal organization that preserves the history and legacy of the Union veterans who fought during the Civil War to save the Union and end slavery. 
The national headquarters of the SUBCW is located at the National Civil War Museum in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. When you join, you enter a national network of men who form lifelong bonds, honor their heroic ancestors, and promote historic preservation, education, and patriotism in their communities. The SUVCW is the heir to the legacy of the Grand Army of the Republic, the famous post-war National Association of Union Civil War Veterans. Based on the principles of fraternity, charity, and loyalty, the Sons of Union Veterans of the Civil War accepts both descendants of Civil War veterans and non-descendants. Visit them today at www.suvcw.org or email them at join at suvcw.org. The views, information, or opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of the SUVCW. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Whether you're selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. From the launch your online shop stage, all the way to the we just hit a million orders stage. No matter what stage you're in, Shopify's there to help you grow. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash special offer, all lowercase. That's shopify.com slash special offer. Although their first try had failed, Thomas Rose immediately put the digging squads to work on a new tunnel that headed to a second sewer to the side of the prison. There was a scare when part of the new tunnel caved in and created a small depression just outside the prison wall. The digger heard two sentries on patrol notice the depression and one tell the other that he'd heard strange noises from that spot, but the second Confederate dismissed it as, quote, nothing but rats. After reinforcing the roof of the tunnel where the cave-in occurred, the prisoners continued to dig toward the sewer. However, when they reached it, they discovered that the pipe was so small that no one could fit through it. After 39 nights of working in rat hell, in foul air and cold mud, the Federals had nothing to show for their effort. Many of the men were discouraged, but Rose and Hamilton weren't ready to give up. They believed they could find success with a third tunnel out the east side of the building, The catch was that this tunnel would have to be longer, stretching completely across a side street that branched off Cary, until the tunnel reached a yard and a shed located between a warehouse and business there. The entrance to the new tunnel was about six inches off the basement floor, next to one of the building supports, which helped hide it. By now, the squad members were experienced tunnelers, and they were delighted to find the soil on this side of Libby contained enough clay to support a tunnel without collapsing. With the two-foot square entrance effectively hidden in a dark corner of rat hell, the diggers began to work during the day. On rare occasions, a guard on his rounds entered the large basement while the tunneling was going on. When this happened, the digger would stop work And, as one of the prisoners later recalled, quote, The others would crouch behind the low stone fenders or crawl quickly under the straw. This was, however, so uninviting a place that the Confederates made this visit as brief as nominal compliance with their orders permitted, and they did not often venture into the dark north end. Working during the day forced the tunnelers to deal with the two daily prisoner counts, since each morning at 9 and afternoon at 4, the prisoners assembled in ranks to be counted. To cover for the squad that was working down in Rat Hell, five of Rose's men would position themselves near the beginning of the line. Then, after they were counted, they would duck down and scamper to the end of the line, where they would be counted a second time. One day, some of the prisoners who weren't part of the tunnel scheme thought the scrambling about was a game and that it would be fun to join in. As a result, the first count indicated three prisoners were missing. A second count ended with 15 extra men. 
The civilian clerk employed by the Confederates to conduct the count was angered and frustrated when he realized what was going on and the prisoners exploded in laughter. Rose and his fellow tunnelers didn't think it was funny, though. They feared the incident would raise suspicions among the guards. But thankfully, the rebels appeared to write it off as a harmless prank. But nevertheless, to be safe, the work was shifted back to nights. The digging progressed at a fairly rapid rate, so much so that Major Bedden MacDonald of the 101st Ohio, who was digging, got it into his head that they'd reached the desired point across the side street. Rose disagreed, but MacDonald took it upon himself to break through to the surface. To his dismay, he realized the tunnel was still short of their target, and the small opening he'd made would be in clear view of anyone who cared to look. Someone ran to awaken Rose. He made his way down to Rat Hell, then crawled inside the tunnel to examine the hole. He saw a chance to turn this narrowly averted disaster into something positive. Stripping off his shirt, he stuffed it into the opening so he could look for it the next day from an upstairs prison window and, based on its location, gauge the progress of the tunnel. He couldn't spot the shirt the next day, though, so he returned to the tunnel the next night to replace it with a shoe. The next day, he was able to see the shoe and realized the tunnel needed to turn slightly to the left. Rose was working in the tunnel when he dug under the bottom of a fence post. It was the 18th day of digging in this most recent tunnel, and the passage had grown to 60 feet in length. Rose rolled onto his back and began to chisel his way upward. Rose pulled himself up through the opening he made to find he was in an open shed with the board fence between him and the prison. He walked down a wagonway that led up to a gate. Exiting the gate, he was free to enter the street that ran parallel to the canal. Before Thomas Rose retraced his steps to the tunnel opening, he reconnoitered the surrounding area. Then, as he slid back down into the tunnel, he pulled a plank over the opening. A short time later, Rose was back in Rat Hell, where, as he later recalled, he happily announced that the, quote, underground railroad to God's country was open. Rose was tempted to use the tunnel at once, but he realized it was a better idea to take a full night to escape and get clear of Richmond. Since by this time it was three in the morning, and in only an hour, Confederates would be in the kitchen to begin preparations for breakfast, it was agreed to delay the escape until the following night. While the tunnelers anxiously awaited the hour of their escape, they worked out some details of their plot. The escape would proceed in two phases. First, the 15 men who worked to dig the tunnel would make their break, followed an hour later by 15 more men, each chosen by one of the tunnelers for the privilege of joining in the escape. Colonel H.C. Hobart of the 21st Wisconsin was drafted to see this plan was followed. Among Hobart's duties were pulling up and hiding the rope ladder and rebuilding the wall in the kitchen fireplace. The next night, Hobart was to lead a second group out. On the third night, a leader of Hobart's choosing would set out with another group. The process would be repeated until the Confederates intervened. At 7 o'clock on Tuesday evening, February 9, 1864, the tunnelers assembled in the kitchen. After removing the bricks that covered the entrance to the S-curve tunnel, they slipped down it, one by one, into rat hell, hopefully for the very last time. Rose was the last man to go, and when his turn came, he said goodbye to Hobart and then disappeared down the hole. Rose waited until Hobart pulled up the ladder and repacked the bricks. Then he joined the others at the entrance to the escape tunnel and placed them in order. He gave each of them a final word of caution, thanked them for their hard work, shook their hands, and wished them luck. Rose entered the tunnel first, followed by Hamilton. After all of the men reached the shed, they slipped down the wagonway in twos and threes, 
with Rose and Hamilton again taking the lead. As the escapees exited the gate and entered the street, they dispersed into the Richmond night. Meanwhile, inside Libby, word of the escape spread quickly among the prisoners. Hobart tried to keep order, but was overwhelmed by dozens of men trying to find the tunnel. When they discovered the entrance to the S-curve, they began, in Hobart's words, quote, jumping down like sheep. Down in Rat Hell, at the entrance to the escape tunnel, men jostled to be next through the opening. Only the approach of dawn stopped the flow of escapees. The remaining prisoners replaced the bricks at the fireplace, and the guards began their morning routine, unaware that 109 escaped federal officers were on the loose. As Thomas Rose and Andrew Hamilton made their way through Richmond, they happened upon a sentinel at a Confederate military hospital. Walking in the lead, Rose strode boldly past the guard unchallenged. Hamilton turned and went off in another direction. At the eastern outskirts of the rebel capital, Rose followed the tracks of the Richmond and York River Railroad. His goal was to reach Union lines down on the peninsula southeast of Richmond. He followed the railroad tracks until he reached the bridge over the Chickahominy River, which was guarded by the enemy. The sun was up by this time, so Rose hid in the hollow of a log for the day. That night, he successfully forded the Chickahominy. Thoroughly soaked, he continued his trek through the Virginia countryside until dawn when he encountered a Confederate patrol. He found a hiding place in the woods and slept until the following night. When Rose awoke, he discovered that his clothing, wet when he had fallen asleep, was frozen stiff. Nevertheless, again he started out toward friendly lines, and again came upon Confederates. So he slipped off to a secluded area of the woods, built a fire, and slept soundly. The next day he set off again and continued until he reached New Kent Courthouse, 22 miles from Richmond. As Rose passed through an open area, a cavalryman spotted him and immediately trotted in his direction. Rose dashed into a nearby thicket and crawled through a long ditch overgrown with thorny brush, eventually eluding the horseman and his comrades. Rose was now on the Williamsburg Road. By nightfall, he was close to Williamsburg and friendly lines. He spotted some soldiers nearby and was sure they were Federals. But as three of the soldiers started to walk toward him, his joy suddenly turned to panic as he realized the men were actually Confederates. The Confederate soldiers took Rose into custody, but he had worked too hard to just give up. As one of the soldiers escorted him away, Rose managed to disarm him and knock him to the ground. After firing the man's musket into the air, Rose hobbled off into some brush since by this time his injured foot was hurting him so much that he was unable to do much more than limp away. As it turned out, Rose's escape was short-lived, as another squad of Confederates appeared and recaptured him. An officer urged the men to hurry, since there was a Yankee patrol in the area. That meant if Rose could have prolonged his disappearance in the brush for just a bit longer, the nearby Federals might have appeared and saved him. Though Rose lost his bid for freedom, his co-conspirator, Hamilton, safely reached friendly lines within a few days. Dozens of other escapees did too. In all, 48 of the 109 fugitives were recaptured. Two escapees drowned. Back in Libby Prison, Rose learned of the consternation the Great Escape had caused. The morning after the breakout, when the morning headcount was taken, the Confederates were astonished to discover more than 100 prisoners were missing. They searched the prison, but didn't find the S-curve passage in the kitchen fireplace or the entrance to the escape tunnel in Rat Hell. The officers concluded that some of the rebel enlisted men must have been bribed to let the prisoners walk away. Well, the hapless guards were promptly arrested, but then a more thorough search by the prison adjutant 
revealed the tunnels. Thomas Rose was placed in solitary confinement, but the Confederates didn't want to keep a restless prisoner who had already masterminded one successful mass escape, and on April 30th, he was exchanged for a rebel colonel. After a short stay at a military hospital in Annapolis, Maryland, Rose returned home to Pittsburgh and was reunited with his wife and children. He rejoined the 77th Pennsylvania as its colonel in early June. He survived the war and lived until 1907 when he died at the age of 77. After the war, Libby Prison, due to its notoriety, remained a major curiosity. In 1889, the building was purchased, then dismantled brick by brick and transported to Chicago. There it was rebuilt as the Libby War Museum, which drew large crowds of visitors during the Columbian Exposition, a kind of World's Fair, in 1893. After the exposition, the museum fell on hard times, and it was torn down in 1899. The Chicago Coliseum was built on the spot and used much of the former prison's material in its construction. Other material was used to form one of the walls in the Chicago Historical Society's War Room. An Illinois politician purchased some of the prison's timbers and beams and used them in 1900 in the construction of a barn in Stark County. Known as the Libby Prison Barn, it attracted a fair number of visitors each year, many of them carrying off parts of it as souvenirs. Until in 1963, the owners decided it was more a nuisance than a blessing, and they had the barn dismantled. After that, the Libby Timbers, what was left of them, passed through the hands of a couple of other owners, before being purchased relatively recently by the Pamplin Historical Park in Petersburg, Virginia. That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation. And our recommendation this time is The Greatest Escape, A True American Civil War Adventure by Douglas Miller. As befitting such a dramatic incident, there are actually a number of good books about the Libby Prison Breakout, or at least several good books. And Miller's is pretty recent. It was published in 2021 and uses a lot of great first-person accounts from escapees. You can find a list of all of our book recommendations, including The Greatest Escape, if you head over to the podcast website, which is www.civilwarpodcast.org. As we bring down the curtain on this episode, we want to take a minute to thank the newest members of the Strawfoot Brigade who support the podcast over on Patreon. So a big thank you to Rune S., Jennifer K., Fred H., Jonathan R., Chris G., Bob, D864, and John L. And thanks to all of you for listening to this episode of the podcast. Rich and I do hope that you join us again next time, but until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye.